Aloha and welcome to Stan Energy Man on Think Tech Hawaii. Stan Osterman here on Election Day 2020. That's why I'm wearing my patriotic shirt. And um, man, this is kind of a nail biter, exciting election. That's that's for certain. I'm actually kind of curious to see how Hawaii is going to turn out because, you know, I wouldn't think that a Republican presidential candidate would stand much of a chance here. But I've mm. actually seen a whole bunch of those those Trump uh, caravans with the trucks and the flags driving around Oahu and I'm going, well, this might be a real interesting year in Hawaii. <laughs> It'd be kind of a kind of a real uh, scary thing for the Democrats if Trump actually won Hawaii. I think I think that would be more newsworthy than probably the rest of the election all by itself. <laughs> anyway, enough for the election. So today my guest is uh, Mr. Richard Ha from the Big Island and I've known Richard mm -hmm. for probably 10 years now. Um, went to visit his banana and tomato farm when he was still farming. Um, and it was really an impressive operation. He's a, an accomplished businessman. And he, he worked. Um, he, he likes to work uh, renewable energy, clean energy, and sustainability issues on the Big Island. And he, he takes a very um, pragmatic approach by working with the neighborhoods, working with the community, and getting their input first. And I think on the Big Island, that's critical to any kind of projects that are going on. So he's on today. Welcome, Richard. And uh, I really appreciate you joining me today. And um, why don't you just tell the folks a little bit about, you know, the kind of work that you've done in, on the Big Island. And I know you grew up there. They might even be interested in, in knowing a little bit of your background uh, growing up on the Big Island. Oh, okay. Uh, I... Um... My family is uh, a Kamahili from uh, Lower Puna, and um, my grandma folks, uh, Okinawan and, and from Molokai, they were farming over there. Um, so, the, and, and my um, grandfather was um, a Korean man. I never met him, and he, he uh, disappeared one day, I, I, you know, people, don't know what happened to him. They they just kind of worried that something bad happened. So, but but I I, I never knew him. So, uh, the Hawaiian side of the family, um, we were influenced a lot by by the, we had 20, uh, 40 acres of land down in in uh, Maku, and uh, we would we would we lived at a different place, you know, outside of Hilo, but we would go and visit uh, our, our great grandma and and um, spend some time down there. And I, I actually learned, you know, I was influenced a lot. My pop used to tell stories, you know, about not no can, can, uh, get a thousand reasons why no can. I only looking for the one reason why I can. Um, th those kinds of things. It was just um, automatic, yeah. So, um, it, it, anyway, so what basically happened was uh, this was about like when I was four years old, I, I, my pop used to tell stories. And it affected me all the way to, to now. I, I still can remember and uh, I, I know exactly when I was influenced, you know, when he started telling stories. Um, it, it, anyway, so so what, what happened to me was the kind of stories he told was made you think uh, in the future. And later on, it became kind of second nature that we would always think 10 years ahead. And then, you know, like in farming, think 10 years ahead, figure out where you uh, needed to be and force the change necessary to get there. And what we found out over the years is that small little changes can get you there. You don't have to make one last desperate move at the last minute. So it, 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 it worked all right for us you know, uh, all through our business and stuff like that. Uh, pretty much that's the, the, my background yet yeah, as, a, as a kid. And, and then I grew up... Um, um, I, I wasn't very good in school. I flunked out of uh, UH Manoa, got drafted. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't a bad thing. You know, I mean, I, got, I went into the army and I looked around, well, what can I do that uh, uh, make the best of the situation? So I volunteered to become an army officer. So um, I went to Vietnam and then came back. Um, back in Vietnam, the, the unwritten... Um, rule was we all come back or nobody comes back 
and then you know and you form a bond like that with all of the military people you work with and then the other thing is had i not been in the military i would not have known i would not have experienced what that life was like and you know i, I really respect the military way of doing things in a full around you know and not only that some people were, were relatively young you know i mean in vietnam we're pretty young young people but um you know they handed you authority based on uh, just like they didn't even look how old you were <laughs> okay that's your job we'll do it. and they gave you the responsibility and you did it you know it was just that kind of thing so that that's how i was uh, influenced um then i came back and i grew up quite a bit went back to school and uh, I wasn't very good at economics. I mean, I had no idea what economics was. And then math, algebra, I just barely passed first year algebra, I never went to calculus or I had no idea what that is, but I could read um, and probably was influenced by, you know, we, when we, um, when I was uh, elementary school, there was a house right at the start and underneath that house was boxes full of uh, uh, comic books. Uh, and I spent oh, uh, a lot of time reading. I, I, I probably learned more about reading from the comic books than anything. But anyway, so then, then as, as I, you know, started farming, same thing, you know, just looking into the future and stuff like that. But what really influenced me was was uh, in 2007, you know, just before the Great Recession, uh, we knew something was happening, uh, you know, the prices of, of uh, uh, product, plastic products, you know, all this kind of stuff that's made out of oil. The prices were going up. I didn't make the connection at first. And then, then when I finally did, I thought, holy smokes, I better go learn about this stuff. So I went to um, five peak conferences starting in 2007. And from the first year I went there, I realized, holy smokes, the, you know, the first thing they said was the world had been using twice as much oil as it had been finding for the last 20 years. And I took a step back and said, okay, Chile, <laughs> that's not a good thing. <clears throat> so as, as I, you know, learned and then I started following the, the subject, it, be, it became really clear to me that this, this is really serious. And so I, it, it became my kuleana coming back and, and talking about oil. And that's how come I'm in doing what I do now. Yeah, you know, and, and a lot of people, I think, underappreciate what we would call the wisdom of our kupuna. Uh, and, and growing up the way you did, um, they had a, a very simple way of looking at certain things, but that doesn't mean it's unsophisticated. It, it was a simple way of, of uh, measuring and making decisions but it was very strong, very solid logic. And I, I think that today, most people don't really think enough about the future and planning for the future and looking for a, a path to the future. Because nowadays we make so many quick decisions that we, we miss the second, third order effect. But if you do the path that you described that your, your dad taught you, you see those things as you go along because you, you start planning and then you say, oh, but what if this happens? And what if that happens? And you, you think those through before you make that decision. And I think that's actually missing in a lot of our society today. And as we start to look at sustainability in Hawaii, which I'm convinced and I know you are too, that um, we need to do good planning. We need to do good designing and planning of our systems and and our, our economics. I know you said you didn't do economics in school, but you know, by, by virtue of the fact that you went to those conferences, the economics probably hit you like a two by four right between the eyes when it came to where your money goes and what you have to do. And, and I know we've talked a lot about the economics in Hawaii and how with all the energy sources that we have between geothermal and, and hydroelectric, I mean, you have your own hydroelectric uh, electricity generator on your property, on your farm, um, mm -hmm. things like that. That, that are underappreciated um, and could could take Hawaii completely off the fossil fuel circuit. And yeah. that would have a huge economic impact for us. So but let's use that as a good jumping off point. What are some of the things that, um, that you're looking forward to on the big island to, to, 
to really get us moving more towards clean energy. Because I'm convinced personally that the Big Island is the key to the state of Hawaii um, when it comes to building the, the future. When it comes to designing and building the future for the state, it's going to start on the Big Island. Yeah, so, so, you know, after the 2007, uh, 2008 uh, recession, that recession lasted five years. This one here is much greater. So we've got to be prepared, uh, not only for uh, what happens after five years, but first of all, we got to get through this pandemic thing. And then at the same time, we got to deal with the uh, what the future holds, which is going to be tougher than five years. So, so, uh, and the key is energy. Nothing happens without energy. I mean, energy is work. Yeah? Exactly. I mean, this is real straightforward. So if you take a step back and then you start to think, okay, where can our energy come from? And we are so, so lucky with all the, the different sources that we have. So we can mix and match and stuff like that. And on top of that, we have geothermal which can take you to scale. So, so my, my whole focus, focus now is to try to be practical about um, where, where could we be in 10 years? And, and 10 years is, 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 you know, it's beyond that. You cannot imagine because so, so, it's so complex. But what you do know is that there's a bunch of people that are thinking, holy smokes, okay? So the, the fossil fuels are declining. Um, then what? Yeah, so, so if that is the case, then we got to protect ourselves. And, and when, when we're looking at um, energy, we're looking at jobs. Yeah, and we, when we're looking at the uh, pandemic, we're looking at health. So there's, there's like a, 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 a conflict between the two. But then it doesn't have to be. If we think about it really carefully and plan it, we can get through both at the same time. And we have to. Yeah, so you know, on the Big Island, let's go through the some of the uh, renewable energy. We know we have solar, we know we have wind available. Um, the the very birth of ocean thermal is right down at Nelha in Kona. Um, you have uh, hydroelectric, like you have on your on your um, farm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's like I would say even if you discounted the, the geothermal and just with, with went with wind and solar and the hydroelectric i would say you could take care of the big island all by itself with just those three but if you throw hydro if you throw geothermal in there i'd say you take care of the big island no matter how big it gets no matter how big the the agriculture or or industry gets and you can take care of the rest of the state because there's so much energy in geothermal and you know, in, in talking about uh, uh, geothermal and then looking a little bit further, um, it, we have the possibility of uh, um, manufacturing with geothermal because you can geothermal, you, you can use heat, yeah? Whereas right. the other sources, you don't have heat. So that's just another um, um, option for, for uh, redundancy, yeah? So, so that's kind of what I'm looking at. Uh, and, Essentially, what we, we like to do is go to hydrogen and lean toward hydrogen because we really don't know exactly what's going to happen. We know that it's probably the, a lot of the world is, is moving in that direction. So if we lean in that direction and kind of set ourselves up to be successful, and, and hopefully we can make ourselves a demonstration kind of place where folks that are in, in, in the in the, in, the, in the hydrogen space would want to come here and say, do experiments and stuff. And another thing that, uh, and I agree with you, you know, the electric grid is really important. So within, you know, 10 years, if we can pass on to future generations a really, really solid electricity grid with uh, good sources, mix, mix and match with different uh, uh, sources of energy. Um, and, and if you got also hydrogen, which uh, had a special rate where you could, every single house then could, could actually use hydrogen if they, whatever that technology happened to be at that time. So it, it kind of puts future generations in a nice place. So generally, if, if there's any, any influence we can do in that direction, that's kind of how we're leaning. Okay. 
I tell you what, we're going to take a quick break here, Richard, and we'll be back in 60 seconds. And let's, let's talk a little bit more about the PUC and hydrogen and some of the options that, that we have out there. Welcome back to Stan the Energy Man on Think Tech Hawaii. Stan Osterman here and uh, Richard Ha from the Big Island. <clears throat> so Richard, when we when we finished up, we were talking about um, a little bit about hydrogen, um, maybe wind and solar power, and um, we were looking at uh, using hydrogen from some of the energy storage and. Let's talk a little bit more about that in in the future. You know, if we have people that can be off the grid completely, uh, maybe they have solar, maybe they have some wind. Um, how how do you think that would kind of work out into the mix? Well, you know, if, if people go off the grid, uh, we we know we need to use more. Uh, we we have to be uh, uh, clean energy powered by 2045. So if all the cars on the road right now went to electricity, we'd have to put a tremendous amount of money into upgrading the exactly. Uh, the grid, yeah? So yeah, it's not just the chargers, it's all that infrastructure that has to grow as well. Right. Yeah. So so if people like you're saying, you know, uh, so there's there's a lot of options. People can go off the grid and still we we still be operating. Yeah, so like, um, you know, something I've thought about a bunch is, especially here on Oahu, because we're a lot more dense population wise, but even on the big island, if you had um, a microgrid that was like uh, Javi, uh, North North Kohala area, where you, you kind of had a traditional grid, but using all renewable energy and houses that were far away from the electric lines, they would just be self-sustaining. They could be off the grid with solar and wind and you could make enough electricity, even if you had an electric car to charge your, your vehicle um, with the right setup on, on a uh, individual home. And then other communities like um, Waimea and Hilo and Kona um, and Kau, they, they could have centralized grids that could, that could survive on their own, on their own um, microgrids, so to speak, um, using hydrogen energy storage, but that hydrogen could be generated either for the community or if your house happened to be off the grid completely for yourself. And that hydrogen can be used not just to store energy to turn back into electricity using a, a, an elect a fuel cell, but you could also cook with it. You yeah. could also heat water with it. Um, there's a lot of other uses. So uh, and on the on the microgrid side, if you happen to be making hydrogen for a community or for a microgrid, you're also making oxygen, medical grade oxygen for your hospitals and for your welders. So there's other pieces that feed into sustaining your your community and your environment. Another thing that people don't think a lot about, but one of the one of the best ways to move hydrogen um, when you want to ship it someplace is to make ammonia because ammonia is NH3. It's three hydrogen atoms and nitrogen, and the air is like 75% nitrogen. So you're pulling nitrogen from the air and hydrogen, and you make ammonia, and that's what you need for fertilizer. Yeah. 
So then that feeds into your sustainable agriculture. We're not importing ammonia. We're, we're using ammonia for agriculture and we're also um, using ammonia to ship hydrogen like between Oahu, Big Island and Oahu if we need it over there. And then once it's on Oahu, it can be turned back into pure hydrogen, release the nitrogen, and now you can make electricity and do all those other things with the hydrogen on Oahu that's made on the Big Island with all the renewables that you have here. So as a state, I, I just see this holistic way of synergizing on sustainable energy between the Big Island, Maui, uh, even Kauai, um, and, and making energy that could be shared across the, the whole state without running undersea cables, without even putting up big wind turbines. I mean, they've even talked about putting ocean wind turbines out there. And uh, I'm not so sure that's a great idea here in Hawaii. I know they use it a lot in the North Sea. And I know you've been to Iceland, so we could talk a little bit about Iceland and their geothermal. But, uh, but the North Sea wind projects, people look at that and say, well, that'd be perfect for Hawaii. Except who wants to look at wind turbines when you when you look out your hotel room window in Waikiki, um, and if you put them way out ten miles out, then the water is so deep it's too hard to run cables to bring that ashore. So how do you how do you do that? The water is so deep. How do you anchor those wind turbines? Because in the North Sea they're actually anchored to the seabed because it's only a, a couple hundred fathoms deep, where here it's a couple thousand fathoms deep. So. You know, there's a lot we could be doing. Um, and I, I just see the Big Island as the place where it can all happen. So how do, how do we convince the community on the Big Island that this is all a good idea um, and give them that, that 10 year forward look and talk to them about what's real, what's practical um, without um, being offensive culturally and without, um, without creating fear uh, yeah. or, or doing those kind of things that seem to crop up a lot of times when you have big ideas and, and at the end game, the, the local community says, no, not, not, not in my backyard. Uh, yeah, so we, you're exactly right. We got a talk story with the, with the community. <clears throat> and, and you know, our group, Sustainable Energy Hawaii, we're, we're a, a nonprofit. We, we're not uh, developers or anything like that. What we need to do is, is have this uh, uh, show, how should I say, um, bring the people together so we can have a discussion and, 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 by, you know, and they need to know that we, we are very interested, uh, and, and it's shown by our history, very interested in the, in, in, in the value we bring back to the community. So, so we, we would rather see our community uh, um, um, have benefit from whatever we do, instead of having a foreign com company come in and suck all the all the money out of the economy. That's unacceptable. So, so that that's the role we play, and it'll take some time. And you know, like for example, what we just did with Kyokaha Elementary School is we were working with Kyokaha Elementary School, but mainly because we're working with the community, and then it starts to you know, evolve and become more bigger and bigger, but everybody has buy-in because it, everybody can see the benefit yeah. to, to, you know. So, so our, our thing is pretty simple, you know, but it, it's, we, like I say, you know, we got a tough story. And uh, I, I mentioned my, my background in, in uh, uh, Kamehele at, the, at, at Puna because I, I'm from, and I, I, you know, that's, that's really who I am, yeah? But it, it's, 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 uh, it, it's that kind of old values that you carry with you. And then, you know, people just talk story a little bit. They, they, they know immediately whether you are like that or not, yeah? Right. So our group is all like that, yeah? We're all, um, so, so it's not very complex. And, and uh, there's a lot of experts who know the, the subject really good. Our, our thing is to bring the value back to the community, yeah? Well, you know, Richard, I know you've been to Iceland before, and I, I've been there mm -hmm. several times with the military myself, and Iceland's a very unique place, and they're really, they're, just for those that don't know, uh, Iceland is pretty much 100% geothermal. Um, they still run a lot of their vehicles on diesel or gasoline that they import, but there's really no reason for them to. They could 
easily run most of their vehicles off electricity as well from the from the geothermal but you've been there before and and the people really like it and plus they have to heat their houses and geothermal does a really good job of that as well but how do we get the, the people here to become comfortable and 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 appreciate geothermal the way the Icelanders do. Yeah, it, it, it's going to take a talking story, and 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 um, that that's really what it will take, so that people understand what what it is really and what is at stake. What is at stake is really very serious. You know, I mean, uh, if you go and look at the how much debt we have because of uh, uh, our economic system, boy, it's really scary. So what we really need to do is use, utilize the, the old values about the, the environment, the land, and the respect for culture and all this kind of stuff. We all got to depend on each other kind of things. So we're going to have this discussion because we have not been faced with this serious situation ever before. And yet, if we kind of figure it out and kind of lean in the right direction, we can come out on top and take care of the energy as well as the pandemic at the same time. So it, it, I, I'm really optimistic, but, it, but it'll take uh, groundwork, top story with people. So I, I know that uh, folks like Hank Rogers has been to Iceland. Um, okay. You've been there, I've been there. I know several people from Hawaii that have been. I, I know my old tanker squadron, we used to love to go to Iceland. That's why it, yeah. for us, it was like going to um, a part of the world that you'd never imagine in Hawaii. We, in fact, we used to joke about uh, there's a girl behind every tree in Iceland, and that's because there's no trees, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was uh, it was a beautiful place. It's it's one of those places where it's got a different kind of beauty of its own. But they are they're a very hardy society. They they yeah. live in a very harsh environment, um, and and they have to get by with what they have uh, themselves. And I, and I think we kind of have a false sense of comfort here because we import everything, but there's an economic piece to that, an economic price to pay, as you mentioned. And yeah. I really wish we could talk story enough to people so that they can understand that Hawaii's not that different from Iceland. We're a, not, a lot warmer, that's for sure, and the climate's yeah. a whole lot better. But... Um, we, we could be doing better for ourselves, better for our environment, better for our future, if we weren't so dependent on bringing in outside energy, um, bringing in outside food. Um, you know, look back to, to when your ancestors were, you know, their diet was so different on taro and, um, and fruits and vegetables that were grown locally, how much healthier the people were and stuff. And why are we putting up with you know, fast food and, and all the other stuff, um, when we could go and, and take a, a page from our history and and go and live a little bit more um, sustainably and off the land uh, than trying to to have this false economy and take all the risk that you mentioned where we, we put ourselves in debt and we, we, we uh, straddle ourselves with these kind of problems when we could be doing it I'd say look look 150 200 years ago and say there's no reason why we can't feed ourselves you know the Hawaiians did it with the same population two three hundred years ago and they had a system for it and it worked and why can't we do it today with all of our technology and and all that we know today so yeah. I, I hope that you'll keep working on that I, I know you will because yeah. I know you have a passion <laughs> for it yeah but um, I hope that I can help you know, keep working with you. Um, and as you come up with new new ideas and, and new proposals, and I know you've been working with the Public Utilities Commission to try and, you know, make them aware of options that uh, would give Hawaii more choices in the future for sustainability. I, I, su I, I just applaud your efforts doing that and the group that you have over there on the Big Island, the Sustainable Energy Coalition, you know, that, that group. Um, you know, that, that's, yeah. that's a great thing. And I'm going to give you the last 30 seconds to just uh, close us up here. Oh, okay. Uh, first of all, it's uh, uh, our website is sustainableenergyhawaii.org. So you can go over there and see all the different things that we're, we're doing. 
Yeah, you know, and and I I've been wondering. Okay, you, you know, we we talk we're talking about energy, and energy, the primary source of energy is food, right? Not oil. It's food. So okay, so but we live in this world today. Could we say um, tax? Not maybe not tax, or or we, uh, let's just use tax. All the energy prov uh, uh, providers, X amount, put them in a pot for maybe the Farm Bureau or somebody to benefit the farmers. Because as it is right now, you, you know, we only supply 10, 15 percent of the food we eat. And the farmers are having a, such a hard time. And no. it's tied to energy. You know, right now, the energy price is low. But that's anyway, just a thought. No, I, I, I hear you. It, it frustrates me. That um, that more local farmers can't make a living um, and and struggle. I mean, I I do a lot of shopping at Costco. I mean, I'll, I'll speak in truth, you know, here on on the on the TV. Um, but I tell you what, when I go there, I buy local papayas. You know, I I buy as much local produce as I can there that I know is produced in Hawaii. Uh, pineapples, bananas, papayas. Um, and poi, they have, you know, they have uh, good sized bags of poi that's really tasty too. Um, and I try and support the local farmers as much as I can because I, I think maybe even instead of taxing, we just need to have that political will or economic will to support our own small businesses and our farmers. And I, I know that some of the grocery stores here, like Foodland and stuff, do a great job of promoting local produce. A lot of our restaurants promote local produce. I know a lot of our hotels promote it, but and I, I really I agree with you. You know, for human beings especially, it's food is our energy, and there's no reason why we should be steaming big ships from the mainland. And they're probably getting their food from South America in the off season and stuff. Mm -hmm. Why why don't we just do it here? We can do everything here. The Big Island has almost every climate that there is on the planet, so. I don't see why we couldn't grow pretty much anything that we wanted on the Big Island if we wanted to. Okay, Richard, well, I tell you what, it's half hours blasted by here and I appreciate your time and I appreciate the work that you're doing on the Big Island. I, I try and keep touch with you every couple of weeks and, uh, and keep it up. You're doing a great job over there. And uh, if I can help or if any of the folks uh, at Blue Planet uh, Research can help, please let us know. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, thanks a lot, Jen. Really appreciate it. Okay, Richard, take care. And until okay. next week, Stan the Energy Man signing off. Don't forget to go vote. Aloha.